Welcome to Manwa Recaps, spoilers ahead, watch out, and take care. The Manwa starts off with a boy on the floor, saying that violence was an everyday occurrence. And that his father would beat him senselessly anytime he wanted. To the boy it was as natural as breathing. We see him with a target drawn on his face, as he is being held up in front of the most dangerous weapon known to man. The boy asks if they can't just hit him normally, saying that there's no need to do this. One of the bullies asks if he does not want this, saying that he thought he needed money. Kim Sung Ho is in jail for sexual assault and sentenced to two years. And he says that the boy's done anything that he could until now to make money. He shovels the snow for 30 cents, he warms their shoes for 10 cents, for 20 cents a day he'd act like a dog. And now being a human target should give him 50 cents. The boy closes his eyes saying he'll do it. And we learn that he's inside of a juvenile prison which takes anybody under the age of 19. He says that it is a place full of atrocious teens and that violence and crimes happen every single day. The rubber band snaps and then the coin goes flying through the air. It bounces around the bathroom until it finally lands into the urinal. Sung Ho and his boys laugh, asking if they have more rubber bands. And we finally learn the boy's name is Cha Ju Young. They tell him to go pick up the coin and he thanks them while running. Sung Ho laughs saying that it'd be too boring to let it go this easily, telling him to pick it up with his mouth. We see it under the water and the other prisoners say that that's a bit too much and that someone had bad diarrhea yesterday. Ju Young does not care and shoves his head straight into the toilet, leaving everybody speechless. They start feeling disgusted that he actually did it, saying that he reeks. Ju Young picks it up using his mouth, saying that with his 50 cents, he'll turn it into around $50. Saying that he's pretty much playing them. One of Sung Ho's men say that it's recreational time and they go to leave. Sung Ho tells him that he better clean up so he doesn't smell like shit by the time they get back. As they all walk away, they laugh at him saying that he gave up on being a human. And then we learn that Ju Young is in here, for attempted murder and is sentenced to three years. One of Sung Ho's men asks why he's so obsessed with money. Saying that maybe he has a debt. A guard comes to the door telling Ju Young that he has a visitor. Ju Young says there's a simple reason why he's gathering money. Then when he gets to the visitor's room we see a girl asking why his face is so thin. She asks if he's being beat up, or if he's just not eating. We learn that Diyan is his childhood friend and that she comes to visit him anytime she can. He asks her why she's visiting so often, saying that she shouldn't waste her money. She bangs on the glass, asking if he thinks that she is a beggar. Then pulls out a jar of coins asking why he keeps sending them to her. She says even though she doesn't have parents. That doesn't mean she can accept suspicious money. He's surprised, asking why she brought it here. She asks if he's doing this because of their promise of living together. After they graduate high school, she says that she'll prepare the money on her own terms. So he needs to take care of himself. The guard then tells her that visiting hours are over. She tells him to prioritize getting released from here. As she goes to leave she waves telling him to not overdo it. Telling him that's a promise. The instant she leaves his smile instantly fades. And he looks sad, he thinks about before he got locked up. We see him in the hospital apologizing to her. Saying that it's all because of his father that she ended up like this. As she's all beaten and bruised. She begins to shake and then hits beside him. Asking if he is kidding, saying that he should not be worrying about her. And that his dad is a vegetable after he beat him. If he never wakes up the police will make his sentence worse. Ju Young says that it's fine considering the domestic abuse he's received until now. His punishment shouldn't be too severe, at least that's what he thought. Until the judge told him that he was sentenced to three years of prison. Ju Young is completely taken aback because the only thing he's done was fight back a single time. When he's been subjected to his father's violence for his entire life. Yun tells him to make sure to eat properly. And to tell her if anyone is bothering him. Telling him that it's a promise. He turns his head away from her, explaining that if someone's in prison gets into trouble, it extends their sentence. Whereas being a model student can significantly reduce the time. So he has determined himself to be a model student for the next three years. He stares at a picture of them together after being accepted into high school. Sung Ho comes over, saying that she's quite a looker. Ju Young quickly hides the photo and Sung Ho questions him about it, asking if that's his girlfriend. Ju Young tells him that she's just a friend and Sung Ho laughs. Saying that he must be in a one-sided love, trying to get the picture from him. Ju Young says not this and Sung Ho begins to laugh, saying he shouldn't be barking back, he raises his hand saying he'll remind him who his owner is. He goes to hit him but a guard quickly enters the room telling them that they've got a new roommate. Sung Ho says that he has not heard anything about new fish. We see a man being forced into the room and one of the guards begs him not to start trouble. 
One of Sung Ho's men says that he recognizes him and he is the one who killed seven delinquents in his school. His name is Ma Jim and he is sentenced to 20 years which is the longest sentence in juvenile court. Everybody is scared of him. Even Ju Young is surprised by the fact that he killed seven people. Nobody is saying a word until Sung Ho stands up telling them to stop being afraid. He gets into Jim's face saying that his face is very befitting of a murderer. But tells him not to get arrogant and to behave accordingly. While stretching his hand out. Jim looks down at it, then completely ignores him. Sung Ho laughs saying that he thought this was going to be easy. Then leaps at him with a sneak attack. Jim dodges the attack catching everybody off guard. Sung Ho is surprised that he dodged it and then Jim prepares his own attack. Ju Young says that is crazy and that somebody who has killed seven people is just built different. Never mind, bro gets absolutely mogged by Sung Ho. As he is reeling from the punch, Ju Young is confused, but Sung Ho takes the chance to start beating him. While yelling that he better know his place, as everyone here is below him. Ju Young says that he expected Jim to fight back at least a little bit. But he just sits there taking every single hit. Ju Young says that he didn't expect him to be such a loser. Later on we see Jim sitting minding his own business until Sung Ho smacks him in the back of the head. Saying to grab him some water. Because Jim refused to do even the simplest of tasks everybody would jump him any time he refused. Ju Young says that not even a pig would be this dumb. Now he's going to have it harder because of him being so slow. That night while they are all laying down, Ju Young looks over at Jim. Asking what flavor of mental illness he has, as it shouldn't be hard to follow orders. It's natural to do what he says and not to get on his nerves. He suggests that he try listening to him for one day. Jim replies asking if he's always lived this submissively which catches Ju Young a bit off guard. Jim turns away from him, and ignores him the rest of the night. Ju Young began to think about it, asking if he has been living submissively or not, trying to get out of here. It cuts to Yun who is on her way back from the prison saying that it's so cold. She says that Ju Young's lost too much weight and she should pack him some food and he may not want to talk about it as he's probably having a rough time but he should eat well at least. She smiles saying that even though it's not much, he should feel touched that she's bringing him a lunchbox. As she heads across the street since the crosswalk is green, a truck quickly speeds into frame. She looks over at it shocked but truck Kun does not slow down. Ju Young lays there with his eyes closed. As we see Yun's body laying on the road as well as the food she packed for Ju Young just as motionless as she is. The next day a guard tells Ju Young that he is sorry. Ju Young asks what he is talking about. The guard tells him that there was an accident yesterday in front of the prison. He continues to explain the news to Ju Young, whose heart begins to sink after being told the news. It cuts to him sitting in the middle of his room and one of Sung Ho's men notices him. Sung Ho opens the door asking if he didn't clean the bathroom yesterday. He storms over saying that he's been out of it all day. Sung Ho then notices that he is holding the picture of Yun in his hands. One of his men tells Sung Ho about how she was killed yesterday in front of the prison and how she was his girlfriend. Sung Ho laughs asking why he lied about her being his girlfriend and snatches the picture out of his hands. Asking what he'll do now that his girlfriend is dead. He says that she's quite cute and that it's a waste for him to be with her. Then he asks if anybody wants the picture saying that he'll start it at 50 cents. They all begin to bid on it. A pork chop asks if it's possible to go on a date with the girl. The other henchman laughs asking who would date a dead girl. Sung Ho says that if she were alive, not only would it be a date, but he would have plenty of fun with her while licking his lips. They all start to call him crazy asking if he wants to be arrested again. Ju Young sits there in complete silence and we see Jim watching him from across the room and recalls the conversation he had with him about how he's living submissively. But then decides that it's none of his business. Something catches his attention, as Sung Ho keeps talking, a fist comes barreling in from the side, hitting him in the face, as Ju Young knocks him straight to the floor. Everybody is caught off guard by this. Even Sung Ho, who lets out a scream, Ju Young looks like he's lost all reasoning. Jim watches this and flashbacks us to the other day when Ju Young was telling him about how his dad is the right hand man of a pretty large gang, and ever since he was young he was beaten on a daily basis. But he could not do anything since it was his father. But there was one time where he couldn't take it any longer. And he refused to sit back. And that was when he messed with Yun. Sung Ho curses at Ju Young and tells his men to run his shit. This flashback continues as Ju Young says that at least while being beaten by his father he learned properly how to fight. And we see him taking on Sung Ho's henchmen. As blood flies across the room, Jim begins to have some cold sweats. We see blood everywhere in the room as Sung Ho apologizes to Ju Young profusely pleading with him saying that he can give him money. Saying that that's why he's always listening to them, right? 
It's because he needs money. Ju Young says that money is fine and all, but now he does not need it as he wails on Sung Ho's face. He says the reason for him to leave and then punches him one more time. Or to hold back is gone now. It jumps to a flashback of Ju Young being told to follow in his footsteps. His father tells him to stand up again, and Ju Young does so, only to be knocked back down again and again. His father gives him a cold stare, telling him to come at him properly. And he has to make him stronger until the day that this tattoo is carved onto his body. Ju Young says the only direction his misplaced anger could go was towards the eyes of the dragon, which was because his father had dragon tattoos. The flashback ends with the guards banging on his door, and they open it, surprised, asking what the hell happened here. They ask Ju Young if he did all of this, and he says yes. He gets put into a punishment room, and he begins to hold up the picture of him and Yun. With eyes full of longing, he recalls her asking if his father has gone mad asking what kind of parent beats their kid on their first day of school. She says it's too much, and he should be here to congratulate him right now. Ju Young tells her that it is okay, as it's not the first time. She says she'll go talk to his dad, and he reminds her that she promised him that she would never step foot in his house. And if she breaks that promise, she'll have to call him Opa for the rest of her life. She says that he really knows how to put people down. And then she mentions Seoul, saying that when they graduate high school, she will move to Seoul since she is sick of living in an orphanage in this nasty neighborhood. He asks if she's always been this materialistic, and he starts to realize that if she leaves, he will be left here alone, she asks if he plans to go with her. She grabs his hand, telling him to come along, saying that it is a promise. She says that if he does not keep his promise, he'll have to call her Nuna for the rest of his life. He tells her that he didn't agree to this, and a man walks up, saying they are a beautiful couple, asking if he can take a picture of them. And then that is how that picture was made. On the first day of high school, back at the prison, we hear banging from inside of Ju Young's room as we see him punching the wall. He says if only he had not come here, Yun would not have had to visit. He punches the wall again and again until his fists bleed. He says what happened to her is all his fault, as he begins to cover the painting in blood and tears. One of the guards calls out to him, saying that he's sorry about his situation, but he can't overlook this anymore. He hasn't touched his food since yesterday, telling him to calm down and eat, saying that the living must go on. Ju Young falls to his knees while crying, saying that he is sorry, and he repeats this over and over. Later on inside of the cafeteria, we see Jim eating, while some people talk about some rumors, and how Ju Young beat up everybody in his room and got sent to the punishment room. Apparently the room leader mocked his girlfriend who died in a car accident, making him go crazy. They start to laugh, saying that this is refreshing, and a man steps up and walks over towards them. One of them asks if this means there's a new leader in the room, and the man slams his head into the table, asking what they are talking about without him. He says it looks like they are having a lot of fun, and laughs, saying to let him into. His name is Park Jonkin, and he is in for special assault. He asks them why they find it so amusing that somebody rebelled. They awkwardly look away, saying that they could never do that to him. Jonkin raises his hand, asking the guy that he slammed into the table. He asks if he is okay. He apologizes to Jonkin, saying he should not have said it. Jonkin laughs, then asks them about Ju Young. It cuts to a week later, and the guard is telling Ju Young that the room leader is still in the hospital. And they're letting him out in a week considering his situation, but not to cause any more trouble. They open the door to the room and we see Jim, sitting down he watches Ju Young enter but Ju Young does not say a word. Jim starts to think that the situation is gonna be bad. Since he overthrew their leader, so his henchmen won't let him be. One of them curse and then start stomping towards Ju Young. Then hugs him asking if he is okay saying that he had a hard time. They start to chat him up, while being friendly. Saying that it must have been tough in the punishment room. And to enjoy himself and relax. Jim is confused, but decides to ignore it and starts reading his book. Saying that he's only recently come to realize, he says at school there are many factors that matter, but here in this juvenile detention center. Strength is everything. Out in the yard we see Jim leaning on a fence. Ju Young comes over and asks him why he did it. Saying that on the day that he beat up Sung Ho. Jim stopped him and even when he himself came here after killing seven people, so why did he stop him? He asks what the reasoning was and Jim starts to recall the day that he killed all those people in the classroom. Leaving their blood strewn out along with their corpses just laying there. He looks up and wonders to himself why on earth he did it. Jim can't come up with an answer. Then Jonkin approaches calling out for Ju Young. Saying that he is smaller than he thought asking him how someone so small beat up Sung Ho. Then says that he was pretty weak anyways. 
He looks him dead in the face and asks him why he did it and why he rebelled. He asks if he was desperate to take the room leader's spot. But Ju Young says that he does not care about any of that and to get lost. Jong Kun is surprised then smirks. He says he really has a shitty way of talking. Then pushes off the floor, punching Ju Young in the stomach, saying that he hates people like him the most. Those who don't know where they belong and instead of Sung Ho, he will teach him this lesson personally. He grabs him by the hair and starts wailing on his face. While saying he'll show him what happens to a dog who bites his owner. As he goes in for another punch a guard clears his throat stopping him. He glances over and Jonkin starts to come up with an excuse. Jonkin looks over and laughs, saying that it was just a feint. The guard tips his hat and continues walking. Jonkin asks if he knew that a room leader can fight as much as he wants. Under the pretext of maintaining order. Since it's part of the role here. He raises his hand telling him to fight back. He starts smacking him, saying to fight like he did when he took down Sung Ho. He asks Jim what's wrong with Ju Young. Then throws Ju Young against the fence, saying that he's been acting like a beaten dog since earlier. He rolls up his sleeve, saying that if he acts like this, beating him is no fun. He rolls up his sleeve, then Yo Young's lifeless eyes suddenly start to shine. As he sees the tattoo of a dragon on Jonkin's arm and he recalls his father holding him up as he stared at the dragon tattoo. Jonkin says based on his rude ass tone. He doesn't seem to be scared, then says he knows why and it must be because of the accident with the truck. But gets kicked in the face, as he's reeling from the punch Ju Young grabs onto his arm and slams him into the fence and puts his foot on his head. Jonkin turns and curses at him and Ju Young tells him to say it again. Jonkin wonders what he's talking about and then Ju Young kicks him in the back of the head saying to say it again. Jonkin tells him that he's gonna die when he lets go of him. But gets kicked into the fence for the third time. Ju Young grabs onto his arm and begins to twist it. Jonkin starts to tell him to wait asking what he is doing. Ju Young snaps his arm, breaking it, telling him to repeat himself. Jonkin lets out a scream as Ju Young holds onto his broken arm kicking him in the back of the head. Jonkin begins to lose consciousness and takes a quick nap and then looks at him with a cold gaze, telling him to repeat himself. It flashbacks to two old ladies talking, about how Ju Young's dad is a gangster. And that it looks like he beat him up again. And that the neighborhood keeps getting worse and worse. As Ju Young walks home he says that enduring is what he has done the best. He gets to his front door and hears a bang inside followed by a scream. He recognizes the voice and rushes in asking what's going on. His father says that he came just in time and we see Yun lying on the floor. His father asks if she is his friend. Ju Young screams out to her. His father says that she barged into the house and started spouting bullshit, about how she would not let it slide if he hit him again. And that he would be better off without a father like him. Ju Young recalls her talking about saying something, his father says that he decided to teach her a lesson. Ju Young begins to see red. He says that enduring is what he has always done best. And he begins to shake with anger. His father glances at him, saying that he needs to warn her. That if she does this one more time. But before he finishes his sentence we see water fly out of a vase. As the flowers hit the floor. The father continues his speech about how he will kill her. Ju Young leaps at him from behind. We get a pan around the room and we see Yun laying on the floor motionless. As Ju Young beats his father until he is soaked in blood. This was how his father got put into a vegetative state. The doctor apologizes saying that there is almost a 0% chance of him waking up unless there is some kind of miracle. All Ju Young can think about is the dragon tattoo and he clenches his fist saying that this is what he needed. The flashback ends and we see prisoners surrounding Ju Young. They wonder what's going on, saying that he must have really lost it. As he just got out of the punishment room. Yet he is now causing trouble again. Ju Young looks at the tattoo on his arm still full of anger. The guards talk over the intercom saying that recreational time is over and to return to their rooms. We see a man looking out the window as the warden says that it's a bit noisy outside. He says that this place has a lot of hot-blooded youths but he is glad to see the man is healthy, and he heard that he was recently discharged from the hospital. He says if he faces any trouble to let them know and they'll do their best to make him comfortable. We learn the warden's name is Quan Changziok. He asks the man who he is here to meet. And the man smirks. Back inside of the room. We see Jim reading his book while everybody else sits in silence. They glance over at Ju Young and wonder what he is thinking. Jim begins to write saying that he thinks he has ended up in the same room as someone crazy. A guard then comes over to the door and calls out for Ju Young saying to come out as he has a visitor, which surprises him. He follows the guard wondering who it is. He says his mother ran away when he was young and he lost contact with his other relatives. When he notices that they are not in the visitor's room, 
but rather the warden's office's heart starts to beat rapidly. As he hears a familiar voice saying long time no see, his heart begins to sink and we hear the man say that it's so nice to see him acting out in the yard. Ju Young says there is no way and we see that it's his father. His name is Cha Kangryong. Ju Young's is in disbelief, asking how he is here. The warden says he must be pretty shocked, and that his father just woke up not too long ago and it's a miracle. He says it must be great that his father is alive. He starts to recall the doctor saying that his father had a 0% chance of waking up, which pisses Ju Young off. Kangryong says he can't believe that the one who put him in this state, despite him being in a gang for his whole life, wasn't an enemy, nor the police but his own son. He says that whenever he awoke in the hospital, he was genuinely happy and we see him crying tears of joy, saying that this is how his son should be and that this is how it must feel to be a parent. He calls him his beloved son. He says there is nothing this father of his would not do so he had no choice but to kill her. He starts to describe Yun's accident and how he got her ran over, but she was still alive afterwards. She looked over and begged him for help but realized who it was. Kangryong says that it looked as if she had seen a ghost. And how Ju Young would be happier without him and that it's normal for parents to do such things for their children. Then he says she wouldn't understand since she never had any parents to begin with and he left her there to die. He says that he thought he was just a pathetic idiot who only knew how to endure. But that day, he saw true potential in him, and he realized that Yun was the key. He says he wished he knew earlier, and he had no choice but to kill her and awaken him. The warden is surprised, telling Ju Young to wait as he leaps towards his father with eyes full of pure hatred. We hear electricity as we see tasers being shot into his back, causing him to seize up and slam into the floor. He screams as they hold him down. The warden sighs out of relief, saying that was close. Ju Young looks up, as his father asks if he wants revenge. He asks if he wants to kill him, saying that there is only one way for him to do that. He explains how there are a few members of his organization in this detention center, and right now they are just rookies who were just freshly tattooed. But one day, some of them will become pillars of the organization, and he needs to prove that he is the best among them by taking control of this prison. If the gang acknowledges him, he'll rise up to the day that he can reach him and slice his throat. Then he will surpass him, the second in command, and seize the heavenly dragon gang with his own hands. Something he was unable to do in his whole life. He says that Ju Young must be the one to do it, and that he will complete his life. He warmly smiles at Ju Young, then tells the warden that he will leave his son with him. One of the guards feels a tugging on his taser and tries his best to hold it. The warden looks over, asking what's going on. As we see Kang Ryong walking away, Ju Young has grabbed a hold of the tasers, and his father goes to turn around, as Ju Young is leaping at him through the air. He rears his fist back for a punch. Ju Young says that he is sick of his bullshit, and he will be dying here today, but before he can hit him, a man puts his hand on his head, saying to forgive him for his rudeness, calling him young master, then slams him face first into the floor. The guards are surprised and the man says that bringing the eldest is his job. We see he has a giant X on his face. The man stands back up and is caught off guard, since Ju Young is able to resist him with just one leg, even though he is the current acting boss of the gang. Kang Ryong calls him pitiful, telling him to open his eyes and look around, asking if he still does not understand. He can never touch him, and acting rashly will only cause issues. The only way he will be able to control him is by taking control of the prison. Ju Young grits his teeth and his father smiles, saying that he will be looking forward to their next meeting, and then walks away. After the hallway is cleared, Ju Young stands back up while shaking out of rage. It jumps to the woodshop room as we see Jim cooking something up. A guard tells him that he should rest since he has already reached his goal. Some people comment on how great he is with a hammer, saying that maybe that's how he killed those seven people. But they laugh at him, saying that he doesn't have the vibe of a murderer, but rather a loser. A man walks in, saying that he has brought the toolbox. He is told to put it over by Jim, and as he gets close, he stops and lets out a surprised sound. He drops the toolbox, the supervisor asks why he dropped it. And he says that he suddenly lost strength in his hands. Jim looks at the nail on the floor and sees it shining, and then looks up as the man says, holy shit, as he recognizes Jim. He says it's been so long, and they have not seen each other since middle school. We learn that his name is Yoon Gunman, and he is here for robbery and arson. He says he saw him on the news, asking if he remembers who he is. Jim says he does remember him, and calls out his full name. Gunman says that he had something to ask him if they met again, asking if he was really the one who killed those seven people, saying that it was hard to believe that somebody like him would be able to do that. Jim asks what he is trying to say, 
And gunman says nothing in particular, just that he was always a model student. The supervisor tells them to stop yapping and return to their seats. Gunman says that he hopes they see each other again. Jim looks down at all of the nails, and then realizes that when he was clenching his fist, he grabbed onto the sharp end of a nail. That night, inside of the rooms, we see everybody doing their own thing, and Ju Young sits there, lost in thought, about how he only has one goal now, and that is to kill his father. He wonders where to start. As his roommates talk about how hungry they are, they ask if they should report the prison, and how they wish there was better food here. One of them says he wishes for pizza, and after being reminded that he is in prison, he says that it's called a wish for a reason. He gets told to shut up as a prison guard walks by. Ju Young thinks about something, and then calls out to the guard. Everybody is confused, wondering why he's talking to the guard all of a sudden. Ju Young says that there's nothing wrong, then asks if they can order pizza. The guard reminds him that this place is a prison, telling him to come out right now. Then we see one of his roommates, pogging out of his gourd at the fact that they actually somehow got pizza delivered here. They start to talk about how long it has been since they had food from the outside. Then, thank Ju Young. Ju Young says that he wasn't sure if it was true, but the prison warden and the guards are giving him special treatment since he is Kang Ryong's son. And he wants to know how far this special treatment can go. The other inmates start to wonder about Ju Young's identity, saying that maybe his father is a congressman. Ju Young resolves himself to take advantage of everything that he is given, along with the fact that his father is influential. Some of the inmates start to ask why Jim won't eat, saying that he should grab a piece, also that he has been acting weird all day. As we see him fiddling with his hand in the corner, they wonder if something happened. Later on, we see them working. As he goes to hand a box to Ju Young, we hear gunmen screaming that his hand slipped again, this time throwing the box over Jim, causing some of the nails to get stuck inside of him. Gunman apologizes, saying that his hands are slippery. Jim turns and glares at him, asking him what he thinks he is doing. We hear somebody else say that it's not like Gunman said, and that he's looking down on him. We see there are three people. We learn that Gunman told them that an SSS level murderer is actually my underling. That's the next Manwa title. The man asks if he was just full of shit. Gunman is silent for a second, and then starts to laugh, saying, to just watch. He tells them all about how Jim was a kiss ass since they were young. Gunman asks Jim if he forgot all of their wonderful memories together, then grabs him by the back of the head, slamming his face toward a nail, saying, surely this will make him remember. As the nail gets close to his eye, he starts to flash back to Gunman asking why he's shaking so much. Jim was begging him to please stop while crying. Gunman laughed, asking what he was saying, since he couldn't hear him on the other side of an Iron Maiden from Temu. Jim begged for him to let him out, and Gunman tells him not to do that, as the real fun only starts now. He grabbed a nail and put it to the cupboard, raising the hammer up, he begins to count down. Then, slams the hammer down, causing it to go into the cupboard. Jim begins to shake, and Gunman asks if he remembers now. Everybody watches and laughs about how Jim is trembling. Gunman picks up a handful of nails, asking if they really believe that a coward like Jim could really kill people. As he goes to punch Jim, Jim grabs onto his hand, causing all the nails to drop. The other prisoners look nervous, and Gunman and Ju Young both look over, as he asks if they want to learn how he killed seven people. Gunman is taken aback and is confused, but the supervisor tells them to get back to their stations. Gunman pulls his hand away, saying to get off of him, and the rest laugh, saying that it was just getting fun. Gunman glances back and clicks his tongue, saying that he is as annoying as usual. Back inside the room, we see one of the smooth brains talking about religion to the rest. How Buddha gave everybody hamburgers, and Jesus gave us choco pies. As they argue, the piggy tells Ju Young that they will be doing their religious duties now, leaving only Ju Young and Jim. Ju Young, thanks Jim, saying that if he had not stopped him with Sung Ho, he would have spent an extra 10 years rotting in here. Jim asks why he suddenly changed his mind. Ju Young tells him that he has an important reason to leave now, as the one who killed his friend was his father. Jim says that he thought his father was a vegetable. Ju Young tells him that it is a long story, but, thanks to him he will be able to leave soon. Jim looks curious, asking if he is mocking him, since he knows that he has 20 years left in here. Embarrassed, Ju Young says that's not it, and that his point is that he will make sure to repay his debt. Jim says that is okay with him. Later on, inside of the wood shop, the supervisor hands him the key, saying that something urgent came up at home, so he will be leaving this to him today, and tells him good luck. Jim looks down at the table and sees a moth. He begins to recall gunmen, and flashbacks us to when they were younger. 
Gunman was showing him a butterfly that he taxidermied when they were 11 years old. Jim tells him that he doesn't really like bugs because they are gross. We learn that Gunman was Jim's first ever friend. Later on in middle school, we see some students laughing about Gunman, saying that he is creepy, and all he does is collect bugs, and that it's gross. One of them asks if he is trying to eat them, and Gunman panics, saying that's not it. The dude makes an L joke that I am not repeating. As they keep teasing him, Jim enters, telling them that he knows they are bored, but to return to their seats. Since he is the class president, and they are afraid of him punishing them, they all leave and apologize. Jim quickly asks Gunman if he is okay. He says yes, and thanks him. Then asks if he is still coming over to his house later today. Before he can answer, some other students enter, telling him to come play soccer with them. He tries to tell them that he has plans, but they peer pressure him into going. Jim says that he wasn't fully aware, but they started to grow further and further apart, and the next year they were in separate classes. As he is walking by Gunman's classroom, he hears some of the students talking about him, saying that he is being bullied, and that he was drugged off to a warehouse today. Upon hearing this, Jim quickly starts to haul cheeks, and is gassed out once he makes it. Inside he sees a bunch of delinquents, and asks them where Gunman is. They laugh and say they have no idea, but says to turn around. As we see Gunman right behind Jim, he pushes him into the cupboard. Jim is surprised, and asks him what he is doing. Annoyed, Gunman does his best to close the door, and then locks it. Some of them say that he really did catch an insect, and they say that he is crazy. One of them says that he told him to offer up his most precious insect, if he wants to join their gang, and then laughs, saying he did not expect this. Jim tries to get Gunman to release him, but Gunman tells him to be patient, since he just caught an insect, he needs to proceed with the taxidermy while it is still alive. The flashback ends, as Gunman says that moths and butterflies are both insects, but one is hated, while the other is loved. He picks up the moth, saying that it is just like him from back then, and then crushes it, saying that everything is all his fault. Jim asks what he means, and Gunman tells him to stop pretending like he does not know. While he acts like a saint, he was secretly distancing himself from him, asking if he thought he would not catch on. He says he knows he was always thinking, that he was just a disgusting moth, while he was a butterfly, glorified by others. The moment he realized this is how he thought of him, it felt like he was living on the edge of a cliff. But then the person who made him like this jumped off the cliff all on his own. When he heard the news about him becoming a murderer, he felt hella happy. He says it felt like poetic justice. Jim clenches his fist out of anger, asking what kind of delusion he is living in. As he goes to say something, the lights cut off. Gunman starts to laugh, saying it does not matter if he's delusional, as his life is already in shambles and he will soon turn into nothing but dust. As we see the goon squad pick him up. Gunman says that he knew he was not normal when he bribed the coach, but he's even more fun than he thought. Gunman smiles, saying not to pass out, as he still has to taxidermy him. He sees a locker and begins to have Vietnam flashbacks. He yells telling them to wait, and Gunman says that it's all because of him. Jim tries to stop him from closing the door, but Gunman closes it and ties it up with chains. Jim asks if he thinks he'll fall victim to the same trick twice. Gunman then says that he prepared a special gift for him on the inside, and we see bugs begin to crawl over him. Gunman says that his insect friends are in there. We see everybody waiting for him to scream, and Gunman asks if he likes it, but quickly realizes that there's no response, saying that even butterflies used to scare him, so he must be trying his best to hold it all in. Two of the goons start to mock him, and the bigger one asks Gunman if he thinks he'll be okay, since Jim is in here for murder after all. Gunman smiles, asking why that matters, and the man says he really is out of his mind. Gunman tells him that he is just getting started, and that they'll hear him screaming soon, and it'll sound as if his vocal cords are being ripped out. Somebody begins to walk through them, as Ju Young asks them how that happened. They say that he scared them, asking who he is. Ju Young asks them how they're going to make him scream, and then grabs onto one of the men's shoulders, causing him to scream. Another goon comes in for a punch, but gets instantly kicked in the face, causing him to fly straight into the locker. Gunman is caught off guard. As the locker cracks open, Ju Young calls out to Jim, saying that he told him he will pay his debt, and to consider them even now. It flashbacks us to the room as some of them are talking, about how Jim got called to the woodshop room. And that the supervisor called him out of nowhere, for some cleanup. Ju Young realizes it's weird, then stands up. He asks the guard to come to the door. The guard asks him what he needs. And the inmates start to drool saying that he's gotta be getting them food again. But instead Ju Young tells the man to just open the door. Which catches them all off guard. 
The guard asks him what he just said. Then the flashback ends as we see two of the three goons on the floor. The bigger one will call him Pork Chop approaches, saying that he has heard about Ju Young. Causing trouble recently. Gunman starts to hum and Pork Chop says he wasn't sure when he saw him. Next to Jim before, but he gets it now. And that they must be pretty close. In a mocking tone, Gunman says that it must be nice for Jim to have such a great friend. And he wishes he had one like that too. Pork Chop says that he's got a real rude tone and calls Ju Young loyal. He raises his fist asking him to be friends with him. But before he can even attempt to swing, we see his world gets turned upside down as Ju Young comes in with the fattest judo throw of the century straight slamming his face into the floor. Ju Young says that he doesn't want to become friends with somebody like him and that he would rather die. He then calls out to Gunman asking why he is doing this. Saying that it's gone too far, Gunman asks what he means by too far. With a smile on his face Gunman asks if he is kidding him. Saying that because of Jim, he's lived in pain. He pretended to be his friend, acting like he cared. Then behind his back tried to take him down like a snake, he says that he is warning him too. That he'll always need to watch his back. We see Pork Chop on cue coming up from behind, he grabs onto Ju Young asking if he thought it would be that easy. And that all this build up was for this moment. Gunman tells him to crush him and Pork Chop asks him again if he wants to be friends. Ju Young says that Pork Chop's grip is no joke, and he needs to get out of this hold. He grabs onto his pinky, saying that he'll never be able to use this finger again. But before he can break it Gunman comes in and stabs him in the stomach. Saying that he scored a point, Pork Chop laughs saying that Gunman is a great friend. Ju Young's face begins to change color due to the lack of oxygen. And Jim says to relax as he puts a chain around Pork Chop's neck. Saying he will snap it, Gunman is surprised wondering when he got out. Saying it must have been when the locker broke, while Gunman is thinking about this Ju Young quickly kicks him in the face, causing him to get launched across the room. He turns back around and tells Jim that was close. We see the chains tighten up around Pork Chop's throat, but he says that he's too strong for this weak shit. He begins to walk forward, while being choked out and Gunman tells him to keep it up. Jim grits his teeth saying that if he strains his neck it'll snap. As he puts his foot to the back of Pork Chop's head, and begins to push forward while pulling the chain down. They quickly begin to start dripping with blood. Jim says if he doesn't relax his neck, he will die here. Pork Chop begins to lose consciousness, and then falls face first into the floor. Jim is gassed out. Ju Young looks down at Pork Chop, while Jim glances over at Gunman and begins to walk towards him. Gunman tells him that he's the victim and it's all his fault he pleads that it's self-defense, and he's done nothing wrong as Jim gets right in his face. He falls to the floor out of fear and starts to grovel begging him for forgiveness saying that he must have lost his mind. Gunman says that he should know him, and how he's always been a loser. And to think of this is just a mistake. But Jim says that he is wrong, and he never thought of him that way. Gunman makes a dumb expression as Jim explains how his victim mentality ruined his life. But it does not matter as he's already killed seven people, and he even thought about doing the same to him right now. But seeing him made him realize that he doesn't hate him as much as he thought, since they were friends. Gunman starts to think about when they were kids, but grins saying that's a load of bullshit. He thinks about how Jim is just a pushover. He says he'll make sure to pay him back, but then decides to show us his new gymnast routine. As he flips around the room, Ju Young says that they'll call it even with this, Jim looks touched, and flashbacks us to when they were talking earlier. As Ju Young asks him if he is just mentally ill. Jim asks if he is picking a fight, but Ju Young says that he killed seven people yet is scared of Gunman. Jim tells him that he was not scared, then they sit there in awkward silence. Ju Young says that he knows that much. While he is not sure what kind of relationship they had. He can clearly see that Jim does not consider him an enemy. The flashback ends with Jim asking what he would know, and Ju Young asks why he hasn't left yet. Jim calls out to him and smiles while thanking him. Ju Young says he's freaking him out. We hear a man sighing, while calling out to gunman on the floor. Ju Young wonders what's the deal now and he turns to see a man asking Gunman why he left without his permission. Saying that he was scared. Obviously Gunman cannot respond, and the man punches him in the face saying he saw a cockroach. While wailing on him. He says that there was nobody to catch it. And he thought he was going to die. Gunman's blood begins to fly across the room. Once the man gets tired of beating him, he stands up saying that it got all over his face. Then mentions how he is getting dirty, as blood is full of germs. He grabs onto Ju Young using him as a tissue paper to wipe the blood off. And then looks up at Ju Young with a smile on his face asking him if it is clean now. Ju Young stands there thinking of what to say and then tells the man no, 
saying that it's filthy, very filthy. Ma Jim is surprised, and the man asks him what he said, asking if he is telling him that he is filthy, attacking at his face, asking if he is really saying that. Before he can hit him, a man enters the room, calling out to them all, saying that if they finish their work, they need to head back to their rooms, asking why they keep standing around. The man just starts to read out Ju Young's number, 7199, over and over, getting right up close to him so he remembers it. It jumps back out to the yard, and Ju Young asks, what's wrong with you? As we see the room members gathered around him, saying they're not even in the room anymore. One of the men, named Gu Nanam, says it's because of Ju Young they're here. People start to look at him from the yard, and Nanam explains that there's a rumor going around that he's hella strong, and when he's around, nobody will pick a fight with him. He laughs, and Ma Jim just wonders what he is doing here. Ju Young sighs, telling them to do whatever they want as long as they don't bother him, as he has things to do, thinking about the dragon tattoo. He says that it's a blue dragon adorned with red flowers, aka the red flower dragon. He needs to find everybody with that tattoo, and he looks around the yard wondering where they could be, knowing they're lackeys of his dad's organization. Nanam asks what he's been looking at since earlier, and Ju Young tells him that he's looking for something. Nanam says that if he tells him what it is, he can find it for him, people used to call him the info broker. Ju Young tells him it's a tattoo, a very specific one that he is looking for, and it is nasty as hell. Later in the day, in their rooms, they are listening to TV as the news reports that youth circle crimes are on the rise, and these groups form gangs to extort money and valuables. Violence and serious crimes among students are going rampant. Ju Young says that those criminals should all rot in jail for a hundred years, only then will they actually learn. He then realizes he shouldn't have said that, as it's not only bad guys who come here. Nanam says he's one of those people and starts to explain exactly why he's in here. Once upon a time, there was a legendary Dikboki place in their neighborhood. He was a regular, and the chewiness of the rice cakes and the harmony of the sauce were on another level. But one day, the local congressman's son, who acted like a thug due to his dad's influence, showed up asking for an order of food. But as soon as he ate it, he got angry, asking the owner if they were kidding him, saying that this is rice cake Dikboki, and he and his boys started smashing the place. Since he wanted a flower version instead, he trashed the place, he goes to swing at a picture, but right at that moment, Nanam showed up to block it, saying that the leader of the rice cake gang is here. His fight ended with a legendary victory, and he became the hero who protected the Dikboki shop. Even though that psycho used his dad's connections to get him thrown in here, he has no regrets. One of the other cellmates asks him why he's spouting bullshit again, and they all start to ask Ju Young if he knows what his nickname is, saying he's called the bullshitter, and that is his real nickname. He was beaten in his previous room for lying, and he still hasn't come to his senses. Nanam laughs, asking why they don't believe him, saying it's all based on reality. Ju Young sits there while they all talk and says that it doesn't seem like he's lying to him, and Nanam is surprised by that. We hear Nanam saying that aphids provide ants with sugar, and the ants protect the aphids, almost like his relationship with the bullies, as he's always been the weasel next to the bully. That is how he's lived his whole life, and based on Ju Young's words, he can tell that it seems like he really likes him. If he becomes Ju Young's right-hand man, his remaining time here will be a breeze. Now he can finally enjoy a rosy life as we see him going to town gardening, throwing dirt into the air. It lands on a man with a familiar voice as he hunches over, and we see it's the man from earlier, wondering what just got thrown on him, saying that it reeks. Nanam's heart sinks as he recalls someone being beaten by the man for getting him dirty. Nanam says that he'll clean it for him, realizing it's his room's previous leader, who is a psychopath with extreme OCD. The man starts to scream about bacteria on his face and how it's going to make him rot. Nanam says he's sorry and that he was stupid to not look in front, and the man gets right in his face, asking him if it's clean now. Nanam says that he's screwed and lies, telling the man it's completely clean because if he says it's dirty, he'll die. The man holds up a bottle of insecticide, asking him if he's serious, and sprays it in his face, saying he'll forgive him just this once. Nanam's eyes instantly get caught, and he starts to feel a sharp pain, falling to his knees screaming. The man says he actually came to ask him a favor and wants to know about 7199. Nanam starts to think why the number is familiar, as the man just continues saying the name like a psycho. He says that he's in the same cell as him. Nanam recognizes it as Yo Young's number, the man continues saying that he said he was filthy after all the effort he put into staying clean. Nanam shakes his head, saying yeah, and the man then tells him to do it with him. Nanam is surprised as we see the dragon tattoo on the man's chest. 
Nanam doesn't put two and two together. Back in the room, we hear Ju Young counting as he does push ups, wondering exactly where those nasty bastards with the dragon tattoos are. He just needs to wait until he finds them. He then hears Nanam glazing the hell out of him, saying that he must have worked out a lot before coming here. He tries to hand him some grape juice, and Ju Young asks why out of nowhere. Nanam tells him that he's got to get in glucose after a workout. Ju Young thanks him, reaching for the cup, and he can instantly tell it's off. He calls out to Nanam as his heart sinks and asks him about the stuff inside the cup, asking who the hell gave it to him. It flashbacks to Nanam being held down by everyone else in the room, and the man asks why on earth he did that. Due to his lies, he is dirty now, and the man starts screaming. He says that the mouth that made him dirty needs to be cleaned it up, and it's time to disinfect it. We see a funnel in Nanam's mouth as the man holds up a can of bleach. Then it shows an empty bottle on the floor, and the man wonders what to do, saying this is bad. The person on the floor was actually Nanam, foaming at the mouth due to the bleach. The OCD freak immediately started cleaning the floor, saying he can't believe it's dirty. The flashback ends, and Nanam asks what Ju Young means by who gave it to him, saying he bought it with his own money. Then he realizes he's screwed. The other members call him suspicious, asking if there are drugs in there, telling him to drink it first. Ju Young asks again why he's suddenly giving him this. Nanam wonders if maybe Ju Young is suspecting him as well. It makes sense considering his usual image as a bullshitter, known for his lies. He thinks this is only natural in the end. But Ju Young drinks the cup anyway, and Nanam is completely taken aback. Ju Young tells him it tastes good and reminds everyone that tomorrow is group cleaning day, so they should all be ready for it. Nanam thinks to himself that if he knew Ju Young would drink it right away, he would have just put something in the juice instead of testing the waters. He starts to realize how much Ju Young actually believes in him and begins to feel a little guilty. That night, everyone is getting ready for bed as Ju Young is drawing out the tattoo of the red flower dragon. Nanam asks what's with the cute little drawing and realizes he should take advantage of this opportunity. Ju Young tells him it's the red flower dragon. Nanam thinks to himself that it's not like he can just advertise to the guys that he's the one who drugged him, so he'll analyze his patterns and find a way to drug him without anyone knowing. As Ju Young continues talking about needing to find anyone with this tattoo, he notices Nanam acting odd and asks if he has something to say. Nanam admits he's been curious about something for a while, asking why Ju Young trusts him. Nanam wonders why he's saying this, thinking he's not controlling his thoughts, and tells Ju Young he should doubt liars like him at first, trusting people will only get him in trouble. Ju Young thinks about it and says that being good at deceiving others means he's smart, and a smart guy like that wouldn't make an enemy out of him with stupid lies. Ju Young then tells everyone he's going to cut the lights off, saying they should all go to bed. Nanam notices the drawing of the tattoo and smiles at the smart guy comment. Outside in the hallways, the guards are telling the inmates that the Ministry of Justice is coming for an inspection, and it needs to be cleaned as thoroughly as possible. We see all the inmates going to town cleaning. It jumps to the bathroom, where the man says he promised he would help him with the disinfecting, and he really said he would do it, yet now he's trying to back out. Nanam regrets getting involved, saying maybe he shouldn't have done this. Nanam tells the man he asked Ju Young and he really regrets calling him dirty, but doesn't finish, saying he means that word and he's a bit introverted, so he got him to apologize. The man sighs and glares at him with a very angry expression, saying he's lying again, and punches him in the stomach for lying, knocking him back into a wall. The man says he can't forgive 7199 and refuses to do it. He then soccer kicks Nanam's head, putting it into the urinal, and begins to open another thing of bleach, saying he'll have to do it again and disinfect him, both of them, himself. He flushes the toilet, and Nanam starts to scream for help. His heart starts to race as he thinks he's going to die, and he starts to drink the water, gross, saying this is really the end. Then we hear Ju Young asking what the hell he's doing in the bathroom, calling him dirty once more. Correction, he calls him fucking filthy. Nanam calls out to Ju Young, asking why he's so late. It jumps back to Ju Young cleaning in the hallway, and Nanam says he has something to tell him. Ju Young asks what he did all of a sudden, and Nanam says that someone threatened him, telling him to feed Ju Young pesticide. Ju Young is surprised, and Nanam says that he was born into this world as a man, so he refuses to betray a close friend, and pours it all out onto the floor, saying he won't bow to such threats. Even if the consequences are dire, he'll go and refuse right now. Ju Young is surprised, and Nanam says he almost forgot to tell him that the tattoo he was drawing the red flower dragon, might have been on the guy who threatened him. Nanam says it's just as Ju Young said, He's a smart guy, and this is all he wanted. 
Ju Young realizes that his hands are a little wet. Nanam watches, as Ju Young walks up. The man glares at Ju Young as he watches him use his shirt to wipe away the liquid on his hands, saying that being too smart is also a problem. The man starts foaming at the mouth like a rabid dog, calling him a germ-infected bastard, saying he's going to kill him and pour bleach down his throat. Ju Young grabs onto his collar, lifting him into the air, calling him noisy, and slams him down, asking if he was the one who threatened to kill him. He sees the tattoo and says, lucky him. Now he can beat him up without feeling guilty about it because he knows he's related to his father's gang. It jumps to a story about a promising rising star in martial arts. Mixed martial arts. And that his signature move was grabbing the opponent by the abdomen and squeezing, as if it was about to burst. But in reality, it was a dirty play that blocked the opponent's hands so they could not tap out. As we see, the OCD freak is the one doing it. But after a certain day, in which his opponent yacked all over him, covering him in vomit, nobody ever saw this move ever again. Because ironically enough, the rising star, who was notorious for playing dirty, developed a critical weakness for a grappler. Germaphobia. As he sits there repeating the word dirty, over and over cleaning his locker. Ju Young sits atop him, calling out to him, asking if he's going to keep holding out without answering. Telling him to spill everything he knows about the heavenly dragon. The germaphobes start saying the word dirty over and over. He goes to punch Ju Young, telling him that his skin is rotting and starts naming a whole list of bacteria that he could get. Ju Young smacks his hand away, saying even in this situation, he's worried about that. As he blocks another futile attempt from him. Nanam says that he's punching him like he's swatting flies and he's so glad he's sided with Ju Young. The germaphobe repeats his number, 7199, saying that he is going to kill him. Ju Young says that it looks like he's not understanding. He hates this too because it's so filthy. We see him put his hand in the urinal, saying he guesses he needs to use shock therapy as his hand is literally soaked in piss. He tells the germaphobe to open his mouth. This is our Kelly's wet dream. Back when he was an MMA fighter, we see the man saying that he sweat too much and he needs to quickly wash it off. As he opens his locker, a bunch of garbage falls out of it, which startles him. He screams, saying that it's trash. Then the serial vomiter slams him down into the garbage, saying that there are rumors that his germaphobia is so severe that he can't grapple at all. Seeing as how he can't get out of the situation, it must be true. Asking if he knows how humiliated he was after throwing up in the arena. He says that he plays way too dirty while holding a piece of garbage. Then he grabs onto the germaphobe's mouth, telling him to open it, as he's going to shove this down his stomach. The germaphobe starts to scream no, saying that it's dirty. As we see him bleeding from the gums, he says that anyone who makes him dirty, as we see the man spinning, and it overlaps back to Ju Young getting flipped as well. He grabs onto his hands and starts to do his signature pose, saying that he's going to beat him mercilessly. And starts squeezing his legs around Ju Young's waist, causing him to make a pained face. He says now he's going to squeeze until his guts burst. We see Ju Young struggling, and Nanam also spots this, wondering if he should help him or not. If he stays like that, he will lose. Then something surprises him, as Ju Young says this reminds him of the old days. As the son of that man, he never hugged him once, but at least when he taught him how to fight, he would hug him tight enough to break his bones. He begins to twist the germaphobe's wrist, saying seriously what a disgusting memory, as he begins to counter the position. He says that, thanks to that, he's as used to fighting on the bare ground as he is to taking a piss, small p obsession here. We hear the germaphobe's back pop, and he starts to make a very pained expression. And Ju Young says he wonders if he'll burst first, or if maybe his spine will give out instead, as we hear his arms snapping as well. His spine continues to crack, and the germaphobe begins to cry while screaming. His arm starts to shake, and Ju Young is confused, asking if he's trying to tap out, so he'll let him go, and smiles, saying that no one taught him anything about that. The germaphobe's heart sinks as the crunching sounds continue. We see everybody is still cleaning like normally, while the germaphobe now has a funnel in his mouth and Nanam is telling him to hold still. He says that he's still fiercely resisting, and how can it be so hard for someone of the same species to get what they're saying, and maybe the shock therapy wasn't enough, and they might actually have to piss in his mouth. Ju Young sighs, saying that he really didn't want to, and he starts to take his pants off, saying among everything they can do here, this is definitely the most shocking. The germaphobe starts to have muffled screams, and Nanam tells him to open his mouth as the lemon juice is going in. Ju Young says he really wonders what it tastes like, bro is high key a freak. The germaphobe begins to scream while crying, saying that he'll talk. They take the funnel out of his mouth, and he pants out of relief. 
Ju Young tells him that's good and now he needs to tell him everything he knows about the heavenly dragon. The germaphobe flashbacks us to when he got the tattoo, the tattoo artist, who was a woman, mentioned that he she knows he is quite the OCD but not to worry, as everything was sterile and she'd make it very pretty. She talked about the heavenly dragon, asking him if he even knew why such a big group was accepting a minor like himself. She explained that the dragon represents power and strength, and the flower represents vitality and liveliness. However, it is inevitable for a flower, no matter how beautifully it blooms, to wither and fall to the ground. The heavenly dragon is looking for the next generation of seedlings to bloom. Underage kids are full of potential power that adults don't have. Dr. Disrespect loves it here. Depending on the situations they encounter or the experiences they face, they can grow explosively. So the group quickly recruits young talent and nurtures them in its garden. The little seedlings that grow come to bloom as the flowers of the heavenly dragon. His head jolts back from the tattoo, and the flashback ends as he tells Ju Young that's everything he knows and that he is just a pawn, begging to be let go. Ju Young says this must be why the person he called father raised him by training him to the brink of death ever since he was a young boy, it was all to get him to bloom faster than anyone else. Nanam calls out to him, wondering why he's not doing anything. Then the germaphobe asks Ju Young why he's asking about the group, wondering if he's trying to enter the heavenly dragon too. Ju Young gets pissed, and the germaphobe says to think 7199 would want to be a part of the heavenly dragon that must be why he's always kept him in check. He offers to recommend him to the heavenly dragon if he wants to try to look good in front of them. Ju Young's veins begin to pop out of his face as he sighs, grabbing onto the man's throat, who asks what he's doing all of a sudden, saying he told him everything he wanted. Ju Young rears his fist back, telling him to shut his mouth, saying he's just hitting him because he feels like shit, and then punches him straight in the face. Back in the hallway, one of the guards says it's time to finish up. Ju Young scrubbing the floor, saying it's not going away, and he needs more disinfectant, Nanam quickly appears handing him the disinfectant calling him a lord. Ju Young asks why he's doing this, and Nanam, thanks him, Ju Young asks why, and Nanam says that because he killed a guy with OCD, he can sleep comfortably tonight. Ju Young says that he didn't kill him, though. Now that he mentions it, didn't he say he was tortured with disinfectant back in his old room? Normally, people die from that, yet he lived. Nanam explains that he was foaming at the mouth, and it was really scary, but he swapped it with soapy water, so it wasn't actual bleach that he drank. Bro is smart, Nanam admits he wanted to get switched to another room, so he did everything he could to set up the situation. He made the germaphobe go crazy, and he keeps getting chills whenever he thinks about it now. Ju Young is speechless and then tells him that regardless, there's no reason to thank him since he found the tattoo. Nanam says that from what he's heard, it seems like a tattoo of a scary group called the Heavenly Dragon and asks Ju Young why he's looking for it. Ju Young says he wants to kill them all. Nanam says that doesn't sound like him, and Ju Young says he's finally found two people, but wonders where he'll find the rest. Nanam laughs, saying it's going to be quite hard to find a specific tattoo, as there are so many people who have ink on their bodies. Ju Young asks if the previous two had anything in common. Now that he thinks about it, both of those guys were the heads of their rooms, and he realizes he should try looking for the other heads. Nanam says he's sure Ju Young won't have to do that, since next week is when all of the heads gather together for a meeting because it's the day the committee meets up. Ju Young is surprised and asks about the committee. Nanam says it makes sense why he wouldn't know about it just yet. Every quarter, the heads of each room come together for a friendly discussion, or at least that's what it looks like on the surface. But in actuality, it's a place within the prison where they talk about various illegal topics, in other words, like an illegal cartel. Ju Young tells him not to get so close but says it's good since that means all the heads will be there. Nanam then tells him to be really careful, asking if he didn't forget that this place is a juvenile prison for the worst criminals in the nation. Among them, the most dangerous people are gathered, so Ju Young shouldn't do anything that stands out. It jumps to the committee of all the heads. They're talking about Jiangcha and the guy with OCD both being taken out, saying it was pretty crazy and that the guy who did it is someone called Ju Young. As we see the dragon tattoo on one of the men's throats, he says he's not interested in the slightest. Another guy clicks his tongue, saying they have to beat the guys who act out like dogs and put them in their place. Another man tells someone named Hyung Jae to control the meeting, as the Lord wants peace. The door slowly opens, and Ju Young says it was so easy to find as he grabs onto a shovel, snapping the handle, saying he put so much effort into finding it though. He charges straight for the guy with the neck tattoo, past all of his lackeys, who all sit there and watch as it happens, completely confused. He asks what the guy said about the seedling, 
as he holds the broken wood to the guy's throat, saying he will stop that seedling for him while holding the man's head in place. We get a flashback to a little before, as we see them all shoveling in the yard. Nanam is telling Ma Jim to listen carefully, saying today is the day Ju Young is attending the leader's meeting, and he should offer him some words of encouragement. Ma Jim is confused, asking what that is. Ju Young says he doesn't know either. Nanam explains that the leader's meeting is an exchange between cell leaders, directly approved by the warden. It's a dangerous place where illegal trades and information are shared. They're not just local thugs, the scale is comparable to massive criminal organizations. Ma Jim tells Ju Young to have a good meeting. Nanam is surprised, asking if that's all he has to say. Ma Jim adds that Ju Young should be careful and have a good meeting. Nanam insists he should say it with more sincerity, warning that it's full of dangerous people with no way out, so Ju Young shouldn't cause trouble, regardless of what happens. All Ju Young is doing is staring at the shovel. Back to the present, we see everyone watching as Ju Young has the man on the floor. Ju Young asks what they are doing, telling them to come at him. The man smirks, saying, no, thanks. Ju Young is confused, the man explains that the cell leaders can use violence under the pretext of maintaining order, and it seems like he's behaving this way because of the rule. But it seems he missed the most important part. The man explains that in the recent fights Ju Young had with the three cell leaders he took down, they likely had justifiable reasons to accept those fights, what's usually called justification. He asks Ju Young if he understands, saying that a fight like this with no benefit or reason means Ju Young has no justification to respond. And despite that, if Ju Young insists on swinging his fist recklessly and disturbing the order of the prison, the other cell leaders won't let him get out of here alive. The man then smiles, asking Ju Young if he plans on stabbing him. They all wait to see what he'll do. Ju Young realizes if he acts recklessly, he might become the target of the other leaders. He thinks that if he turns everyone in the prison against him, the chances of him leaving here unscathed, let alone taking control of the prison, become slim. It was a reckless method, but trying to confirm it was a good idea. The man leans in close to Ju Young, asking him if he's done with his awkward farce, saying Ju Young never planned on stabbing him in the first place. From his actions, it seems Ju Young is hostile towards the heavenly dragon, and the man says Ju Young really doesn't know his place, it's almost pathetic as he walks away. Later, a man with glasses says it's now time to begin the leader's meeting. He mentions that, unfortunately, some people are absent, such as Sung Ho, Jiangcha, and we learn the OCD guy's name. He says all of them are absent due to injuries. The monk guy from earlier says that is pitiful. The man continues, explaining that all the incidents were caused by none other than Ju Young, the new cell leader of cell number 36. They all recognize Ju Young from the rumors, wondering what gang he belongs to. Ju Young glares at them, noting there are about 15 cell leaders gathered here, and at a glance, he doesn't see anyone with the dragon tattoo, except for one single guy. They ask Ju Young if he has anything to say as a new cell leader. He thinks about it, asking what's the big deal about being a cell leader in the first place, and all he says is that he's looking forward to it. One of the men starts to get annoyed, calling him rude. The guy with the glasses continues, saying it's time to move on to the second matter, the income sources operated by the cell leaders within the prison, also known as shops. A portion of these profits from the shops is handed over to the warden, but one person did not pay part of this quarter's tributes. We learn that it was the guy with the neck tattoo, named Park Dohuan, who owns the gambling den. He says it looks like it was a mistake on their part, and they'll have it delivered by the end of the day. The guy with glasses thanks him for confirming. Another man mentions a strange rumor going around, that all the high state games in the gambling den, which are supposed to be built on fairness and trust, are all a fraud. He gets right in Dohuan's face. Everyone watches the standoff. Dohuan says everybody knows what happens if you're caught doing that stuff here and there's no way he would do it. He adds that if it turns out there is fraud going on in his gambling den, they're free to cut off his head. The meeting continues, but we don't get to hear all of it. It jumps to an auto shop where we see a car suspended in the air. A man is begging someone not to do something, saying they've surely done enough and he doesn't want to do any more. We hear him screaming as it turns out he's actually just playing cards, and he says he's screwed. This is the gambling den that Dohuan owns. One of the leaders, named Ji Yunyo, asks someone if this is their first time at the gambling den. We hear Ju Young, saying that maybe he should play just one round of the dice game. He says dragging it out is no fun, and he recalls Dohuan said he'd be the one getting hurt if he tried to stab him without justification. Ju Young looks around the room, thinking it also means that in the opposite case, 
if he does have the justification of this all being a farce, whether it's beating the shit out of him or cutting his head off, he can do anything he wants to hear. As Ju Young punches the ground, Yunyo asks what he's doing. Ju Young says, Would you look at that, there is a magnet inside of that dice, as he has broken it open, revealing the fraud. He announces that everybody in here are complete fraudsters. We get a better explanation, learning that under strict management and surveillance, the juvenile prison was supposed to function for the rehabilitation of young offenders. That was what the outside world thought of the prison. However, after the appointment of Chang Ziok, the place turned into a crime hotspot. The income sources operated by the cell leaders, known as shops within the prison, sent a part of the profits to the warden. In return, the cell leaders received perks and freedoms far beyond those of regular convicts. You could imagine that a criminal cartel was being created inside the juvenile detention center. One of the shops here was the gambling den. We see a man looking down at his dice, saying he's on a roll and he's got the feeling that he can win, but he doesn't know what to do as all his money is gone. He thinks if he could just go one more time, he could definitely win. Dohuin tells him there is a way, they'll lend him money if he can give them collateral. The man asks if Dohuin is kidding, wondering why he's only hearing this now, as everybody's been getting addicted to the gambling den during their time here. Back to the present, with the fraud being exposed, everyone starts talking. Yunyo asks what Juyoung means by fraud. Juyoung pulls out the magnet, saying they're using this to mess with the results. The other prisoners start to wonder if the gambling den is cheating them. Ju Young asks if he said something wrong, explaining they used the magnet so the dice would show the number they wanted. Yunyo denies it, saying the bead is just to maintain the dice's center of gravity. He holds up a magnet, telling Ju Young to bring it close as he drops the bead, which doesn't even stick to the magnet. Yunyo points out that if it were magnetic, it would stick. As they can see, it's a real magnet. Everyone else sighs in relief, saying that scared them. They wonder why Ju Young is causing a fuss out of the blue, assuming it's because there's money at stake. Yunyo says now they can start the game again, sitting down to play dice. Dohuan watches with a concerned expression. It jumps to Yunyo, saying he's amazingly quick, asking Ju Young if he lost it all already. Ju Young wonders what's going on, thinking there's a 50% chance of winning, and wondering if he was just unlucky. Yunyo asks if Ju Young's out of money, but Ju Young tells him to wait, saying it was just a piece of paper as he reaches into his pocket. Yunyo says that Ju Young was doing pretty well for a novice. Suddenly, they hear a man screaming that it really is a fraud. Ju Young glances over to see a man going crazy with a screwdriver, asking if they think he's a pushover. Dohuan then begins to walk up. The man says that doesn't count and he won't give them his money. Dohuan grabs onto his arm saying he was happy when he made money. But when he loses it he sure has a lot of problems. He slams the man's head into a car window, saying that he says it's a scam, asking if he has any proof. The man says that the probability doesn't add up, and Dohuan asks if all he has is a feeling, saying if you cause a fuss without any evidence there's going to be a problem. And he glares at Ju Young while he's saying this, saying that after all you're disturbing the others. Dohuan then lets go of the guy apologizing, saying he only did this for everybody's safety so please be generous and forgive him and that everybody can continue their games and enjoy themselves. Some of the men start laughing saying that everybody's getting worked up today, calling them dumb. Saying they should just do a better job if it annoys them this much while Ju Young is deep in thought. Back in his room Nanam asks him how the gambling den was and Ju Young tells him that he lost all his money and could not find proof of them cheating. Asking them how their results were. Ma Jim and Nanam both reach into their jumpsuits and pull out cards saying that they stole them according to plan. Some Ocean's Eleven shit, then they tell Ju Young he's great at acting. Everybody was so focused on him at the other table so stealing them was a breeze. Nanam asks what he thinks about his plan now. Ju Young says that shit was embarrassing and Ma Jim tells him to cheer up. Nanam says if they really are fraudsters they might find something in the cards. Ju Young says that's right there must be something here. Back at the gambling den we hear a man in pain as he is screaming saying he's sorry. As a car's engine is being revved and a tire is spinning. We see his face getting slowly closer to it and he's screaming he's sorry. Dohuan is asking him why he said it was a fraud and people like him are the reason that stupid rumors are spreading. The man begs him to wait but Dohuan says that he's in a pinch and we hear the man's face getting crunched up. His blood is all on the floor as we see him laying face down. Yunyo enters the room saying that he's sorry. Dohuan asks for what and Yunyo is clearly afraid saying that he's sorry for letting Ju Young cause a fuss at his table. Dohuan tells him that it's okay and it's not his fault so he doesn't need to worry about it and that he should keep doing his best for the gambling den as he's making a terrifying face. 
He says he doesn't know why Ju Young is acting this way, but he is definitely hostile towards the Heavenly Dragon gang he's a part of. He doesn't care if he's after him, but he can't have him messing with the gambling den. And if he causes trouble just once more, then it jumps back to the room as Nanam says he found it and that he can see it. Ma Jim asks what, and Nanam points at the back of the card, saying, "Look right here." In the regular circular pattern, there are two different sized circles, and it's marked, and you know what card it is from the back. Ma Jim says this means they really are cheating, and Ju Young says that he finally found it. The atmosphere starts to tense up, and he says that he found his justification. Back to what Dohuan was saying about him causing trouble, he says that they'll chop his head off. Ju Young can't wait to beat his ass. It jumps to a man named Kim Jong Soo being freed from prison, and someone calls out to him, congratulating him on being released. Jong Soo asks who he is, and the man hands him some tofu to celebrate, asking if he enjoyed himself. He said, "There's no way," and the man says he surely had a lot of fun gambling, didn't he? Jong Soo is confused by what he means by gambling, and the man shoves it into his mouth, saying he's going to keep acting like he doesn't know anything. This is the guy who was given a second chance if he gave something in exchange for collateral, and the collateral he gave was his organs, as it was a consent form. He starts to read off everything on the form as Jong Soo's heart sinks. He says, most importantly, his blood type is O, and he has been waiting so long for this. As we see the back of a van, his people ready to drain his blood. His heart starts to race, and he tells them to wait as they shove him into the back of the van. Back in the prison, in the meeting room, the man says they're all so young and full of life, and that's why the organs are so fresh. And thanks to that, business is booming. And he even got to put in a new tooth. And it is all thanks to his dear Dohuan. Dohuan laughs, saying not to mention it. And he is in here as an organ trafficking agent, sentenced to two years and six months. The man then stops laughing, asking him how long he plans to do this, saying if he leaves the trail for too long, somebody will catch on. The warden might slip out of the blame like the weasel he is, but he could also end up taking the fall for everything alone. Dohuan says even if it gets out and the worst case scenario happens, it's fine because there isn't a single problem in this world that money cannot solve. Back in Ju Young's room. He's saying that it's marked and the difference is so tiny, and he gets why nobody would have found it until now. Nanam asks Ma Jim if he saw that saying even Sherlock Holmes would have pissed his pants in front of his sharp eyes, and he is giving himself goosebumps. Ma Jim is internally cringing. Ju Young says now that he has the sword that will cut down Do Huan's throat tonight. They are going to go to the gambling den, and on cue he arrives saying that his job is very simple. Yun Yeo calls out to him saying that he's back. Ju Young says first he'll start a game at the table. And he says, "This is the trump card table, right?" Yunyo says, "Yes," telling him to have a seat, and then in front of everybody, he'll expose how this place is rigged. After that, he gets cut off as Dohuan says he's here as he takes a seat across from him, saying that he's been waiting, asking him if he would like to play a round together. Ju Young wonders what's going on as he is personally stepping in from the start. As he is personally stepping in from the start, and Dohuan says he was curious, asking if he is after the Heavenly Dragon. Ju Young says he's not going to share his personal matters with him. Do Huan then says, "How about he tells him the reason if he win?" Ju Young smiles, saying, "Sure," asking why it matters, saying, "In fact, this is even better. Now he won't have to go looking for him after he exposes him." All the other inmates say they've never seen Do Huan play a game before, and this is a first. And Do Huan tells him that he can choose the game he wants. Ju Young thinks about it, saying he's already tried the dice game, so he wonders if he should try Trump as he's never tried it before. Yunyo puts the cards on the table, saying in that case that he can play a game that beginners can enjoy as well, and it is the matching pairs game. It is a very simple game where you flip cards and try to match the same numbers. If you get the same number, your turn continues. If you miss, it's your opponent's turn. The key is to remember the position of the cards you've already seen. Ju Young says, as long as somebody knows about the marked cards, there's no way they lose, and it sounds good. If he didn't know about them, he would have completely lost. It is now time for Dohuan and Ju Young's match to begin. Some people recognize Ju Young's name, saying that's the guy who's been going after the cell leaders. Nanam asks Ma Jim if he's seeing this right. Ju Young also looks surprised as he looks at all the back of the cards, saying that the marking on the back of them is gone. Nanam wonders if maybe the marks are so small they can't be seen, and Ma Jim says, "No, there's no doubt about it. There are no marks on the cards." Ju Young looks nervous, but Dohuan grins, saying, "Beautiful pattern on the cards, right?" Which surprises Ju Young, and he says that the gambling den only uses the highest quality card decks, and apart from this, they have many other games for beginners. So, since he finds traditional gambling games difficult, Ju Young now understands that he knew it from the start that they stole the cards. And Do Huan continues saying that you can start with something light like Catch the Thief. Yun Yeo asks Ju Young if he's ready. 
saying that if he is it's time to place their bets. Dohuin takes out a whole ton of money putting on the table saying he should start with around this much. He doesn't get to play often since he's the operator so he doesn't want to make this a boring match. Ju Young tells him that he doesn't have money and Yunyo says not to worry. Even if you're short on cash you can still pay play if you have collateral. Yunyo wonders what he means and so does Nanam and Yunyo pulls up. The organ donation form telling him to sign right here. And just check off the body part for the amount he wants to bet. Telling him to come on now. Everybody watching says. They heard about it, but they didn't think the rumors were true. And that is crazy this is happening inside of a juvenile prison. Dohuan glares at him and begins to laugh asking him if he is scared. Ma Jim realizes that there is definitely a scam in this game and that Ju Young has no chance of winning. Nanam says thank god they noticed before betting and he can quit the game right now. Everybody gets startled and goes crazy as Ju Young starts signing it anyways telling them not to go back on their word. And he can play the game without the money as long as he has the collateral. They wonder what he's doing calling him a lunatic and Ju Young says there's no way he'd say no to that. From the tip of his hair to the bottom of his toenails. He plans to go all in as he has selected every single box on the paper. Dohuan smiles, saying, all right. Both Nanam and Ma Jim wonder why he's doing this since they know they're cheating, and they wonder what the hell he is cooking up. Yunyo explains the game once more, saying that in matching pairs, you're supposed to turn the cards over and find the ones with the same number on them. The first turn belongs to Ju Young. Ju Young says he likes how simple it is, and he grabs onto a card, showing the eight of spades. Then he picks up the next card, which is the nine of hearts. Ju Young says that the numbers are different, so nothing happens. It's now Dohuan's turn, and he grabs onto the nine of clubs. He begins to smile, saying that it's the card he just drew, and he remembers exactly where it was, so he pulls out the nine of hearts since they're just matching numbers and not the suits. The crowd goes wild, saying he got really lucky from the start, and they say in gambling, luck is all that matters. But Dohuan disagrees. It's his turn again, and he says that this is not just luck as he already knows exactly where each and every single card is placed. He gets one wrong intentionally, and he already decided to place one of the cards with the dealer, having memorized them all before they started this. With no evidence, it's a pretty simple yet perfect way of cheating, and he's going to sit there, stay oblivious, and be completely helpless as he takes everything from him. So far, Dohuan has gotten four cards, and Ju Young has gotten none. Dohuan thinks that Ju Young is truly pathetic. It gives us a flashback to his father asking him why he likes him. Dohuan says it's something so obvious, saying it's only because he earns a lot of money. His father calls him a punk and laughs, asking if that's something he should be saying to his dad when he's going to work. He says that he'll give it his all at work for his dear Dohuan today as well. Dohuan says that his father had the world's most reliable and trustworthy back, or so he thought. His father wasn't going to his company every day but the casino instead. From what he heard later on, he had gathered a debt of 50 million from a lone shark, oblivious to the fact that the rigged game system was deceiving him. But we don't get to learn exactly what happened yet as the flashback ends, and Dohuan says it looks like the goddess of luck is on his side. He says that he is not stupid like his father, and he'd rather be the one who deceives. We see he's already gotten a ton of the cards right. The crowd says that Ju Young is unlucky as he hasn't gotten even a single one right, and at this point, the game is basically over, and he's going to cry like a baby while having all of his organs ripped out from him. Ju Young tells Dohuan that maybe he should show them now, and Dohuan is confused. Ju Young grins, saying that this game is rigged while flipping over a queen of diamonds and then immediately following it with the queen of clubs. A bystander is surprised, and Nanam and Ma Jim wonder if he's maybe getting lucky, but they say no way, it has to be a coincidence. But immediately, he flips over a matching pair again, which are both fives, and they ask if luck is finally on his side, saying even then, it will take a while to catch up to 16. But immediately, he gets another one right, and they start to wonder how many he's gotten right back to back. Rather, how is he getting them all right? As he continues, he gets up to 13 in a row, then 14, and now there are only a few cards left. Dohuan begins to sweat nervously, saying there's no way this could happen, as only he and Yunyo knew about the card's placement. Then it clicks and he looks over, seeing Yunyo smirking. It turns out that the other day after work, when he was rolling up his carpet, he spotted something on the ground. He picks it up, recalling that it was when Ju Young lost it and threw it on the ground, he opens it, realizing there's something written on it, telling him to come to the bathroom. He does so, asking Ju Young why he's here. Ju Young tells him that he knows they messed with the cards. 
Yunyo asks what he means by that but realizes they must have been the ones to steal the cards, but they changed them already, so it doesn't matter. Ju Young says he knows they've changed the cards to those without markings, and that's why he's called him here. He plans to be straight with him, telling him that he will save him. Yunyo is confused, and Ju Young says he, along with any other dealers of the gambling den, he'll save them all as they're working to repay their debts by lending people money with their organs as collateral. He promises to repay their entire debt if they help him this one time. Yunyo says that Ju Young is really fluent in bullshit, and if he sides with him and something goes wrong, Dohuan will kill him. Ju Young says he's heard that Yunyo owes Dohuan a big debt, asking if he's sure he can repay it by the time he's released. After all, he only has one week until he is free, so surely he knows what will happen to him. He doubts he'd want to be dragged out to a surgery table the moment he gets his freedom back. His role will be as simple as throwing a pair of dice while lying down. With everybody watching, he's going to expose the truth about the rigged games. Ju Young smiles once as the flashback ends, saying it looks like his luck's pretty good today. We see all of the cards stacked up on his side. Do Huan is utterly speechless. Ju Young says that rather than luck, he should just say that his memory is good since he memorized all of the card placements that both he and Yunyo decided on beforehand. The bystanders start to wonder if that means that it's rigged, and Yunyo confirms it, saying that until now, every single game inside of the gambling den has been rigged by Do Huan and the dealers. He explains to them that he can show exactly what trick was used for each and every game. Do Huan sits there in silence as they start berating him, telling him to just say that they're wrong and that if he did lie to them, he should return their money. He starts to shake, asking why they're saying his gambling den is rigged. We see him holding back his anger as he says that's ridiculous since there's no way he would do that, and he says that it's just a load of nonsense. Before he finishes his sentence, his head gets slammed down into the table by Ju Young, who says this is surely enough justification now. He reminds Do Hun of what he said before about fraud, saying that if there was fraud going on, they should feel free to cut his head off, and that he'll do it. He tells Do Huan that he better get ready to lose his speaking privileges. If you've watched till the end comment, Tekken, to let me know. Subscribe for more videos like this, leave a like or a comment to help the channel out. Thanks for watching.